July 6. Venerable Sisoy the Great Sisoy was an Egyptian by birth and a disciple of Saint Anthony the Great. Following the death of his great teacher, Saint Sisoy settled on a desert mountain called Saint Anthony's Mount, where Anthony had earlier lived in asceticism. By imposing difficult labors on himself, he tamed himself to such an extent that he became meek and guileless as a lamb. Therefore God endowed Sisoy with abundant grace, so that he was able to heal the sick, drive out unclean spirits, and resurrect the dead. For sixty years Sisoy lived in asceticism in the wilderness, and was a source of living wisdom for all the monks and laymen who came to him to counsel who came to him for counsel. Before his death his face shone as the sun. The monks stood around him and they were astonished at this manifestation. And when the saint gave up his soul, the entire room was filled with a sweet-smelling fragrance. Siso, he died in extreme old age in the year 429 AD. Saint Siso is taught the monks, whatever way temptation comes to man, a man should give himself over to the will of God and recognize that the temptation came because of his sins. If something good happens, it should be said that it happened according to God's providence. One monk asked Sisois, How can I please God and be saved? The saint answered, If you wish to please God, withdraw from the world, separate yourself from the earth, put aside creation, draw near to the Creator, and unite yourself to God with prayers and tears. Then you will find rest in this age and in the age to come. A monk who asked Sisois, How can I attain humility? The saint replied, When a person learns to acknowledge every man as being better than himself, then he has attained humility. A monk complained to Sisoi that he could not memorize the wise saying that he read in order to be able to repeat them in conversation with men. The saint replied to him, That is not necessary. It is necessary to attain purity of mind and to speak from that purity, placing your hope in God. The holy martyrs Marinus and Martha, with their sons Audifax and Abahum, Valentine the Presbyter, Cyrenus, Asterius, and many others. They all suffered in Rome during the reign of Emperor Claudius Flavius in the year 269 AD. Marinus and Martha were wealthy people from Persia who sold all their property in Persia and went to Rome with their sons in order to venerate the sacred relics of the holy apostles and the other martyrs. When the emperor asked them why they had come from such a distance, abandoning their household gods to seek dead men in Rome, they responded, We are servants of Christ, and we have come to venerate the holy apostles, whose immortal souls live with God, so that they may be our intercessors before Christ our God. Cyrenus was thrown into the Tiber River, from which his body was removed by Marinus and Martha, who honorably buried it. The priest Valentine was handed over to a commander, Asterius, so that he would counsel him to deny Christ. But Valentine, by his prayers, healed Asterius' blind daughter, who had been blind for two years, and then baptized Asterius and his entire household. All of them, in various ways, underwent suffering and death for Christ, who received them into his immortal kingdom to rejoice eternally. The Finding of the Relics of St. Juliana the Virgin Juliana was the daughter of the Prince of Olshanks. She died in about the year 1540 AD, as a virgin of 16 years of age. Two hundred years after her death, men who were digging a new grave beside the great church in in the monastery of the Kiev Caves, found the relics of this holy virgin completely intact and uncorrupt, as though she had just fallen asleep. Many miracles occurred from these relics, 
and Juliana herself appeared many times to certain individuals. The renowned metropolitan Peter Mogila had one such vision. The holy female martyr Lucy. Lucy was taken captive by the barbarian emperor Austius in Campania. The emperor wanted Lucy as his concubine, but she protested. He then left her in peace so that she could live a life of asceticism. She even converted the emperor to the faith after he gained a victory in battle through her prayers. In the end, they both suffered for Christ in Rome in about the year 300 AD. Reflection From where do we know that there is life after death? We know from Christ the Lord on the basis of His words his resurrection and his many appearances after death. Philosophers who recognize life after death recognize it on the basis of their thinking. But we recognize it on the basis of experience, especially the experience of holy men who neither knew how to proclaim falsehood nor were even capable of it. When Cicero lay on his deathbed, his face was radiant. The monks, his disciples, stood around him. Saint Cisois gazed around and said, Behold, here comes Abba Antony. He remained silent for a while and then said, Behold, here comes the prophets. In that moment his face glowed even more and he said, Behold, here come the apostles. Then he said, Behold, here come the angels to take away my soul. Finally, his face shone as the sun, and all were overcome by great fear, and the elder said, Behold, here comes the Lord. Look at him, all of you. Behold, he is saying, Bring to me the chosen vessel from the desert. After that, the saint gave up his soul, and how many similar visions have been seen, and all by the most reliable witnesses. Contemplation Contemplate the miraculous falling of manna from heaven for the feeding of the people in the wilderness. Exodus 16 How for forty years the Lord gave the Israelites in the wilderness manna from heaven, a heavenly food sweet as honey. How this manna from heaven prefigured the Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of life, who came down from heaven that he himself might feed the spiritual hunger of mankind in the wilderness of paganism. How nothing can satisfy my hungry soul except Christ the living Lord, sweeter than honey. Homily about the terrible price of redemption. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and God, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamp without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 1, 18 Brethren, has anyone ever been able to forge arms against the devil with silver and gold? No one ever. Brethren, has anyone ever been able to redeem from death with the help of silver and gold? No one ever. Something far more precious than silver and gold was needed to be a cure, the weapon and the ransom. The precious blood of the Son of God was needed to apply it on the wounds of sin in order for them to be healed. The precious blood of the Son of God was needed to be directed against evil spirits and by its power to burn them and drive them away from men. The precious blood of the Son of God was needed to sprinkle on the earthly graves in order to destroy death and raise the death. As a lamp without blemish and without spot, the lamp of God was slain for us to pull us out from the threefold jaws of the beast, a woeful but life-giving banquet arranged by God, a costly banquet to announce freedom to men. Sin, the devil and death attacked with all their might the mild and all-pure lamp of God. And they killed him, but they were poisoned by his blood. His blood was shed to be poison for them, but life and salvation for mankind. O oh, my brethren, 
if you do not know how venomous sin is, how wicked the devil is, and how bitter that is, judge by the greatness of the ransom by which we have been redeemed from their bondage. The precious blood of Christ, that is our ransom from bondage. Remember, brethren, that if we are again in our recklessness and evil, willingly give ourselves over to that terrible threefold slavery, there is no one on earth or in heaven who can give a ransom for us. For there is but one precious ransom, and it was given once and forever. O merciful Lord, strengthen us, that we may be preserved in the freedom that you have given us. To thee be glory and praise forever. Amen.